I call this meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board to order. May I please have a motion to certify closed session? Madam Chair, I move that uh, I move I certify that to the best of each member's knowledge, the Williamsburg James City County School Board, while in closed session, discussed only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements as stated in Virginia law, and that only such public matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed session were heard, discussed, or considered. I think you can have a second. Second. Right. Any discussion? It's been moved and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you. The next um, topic is the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'd like to invite J.B. Blatant fifth graders up here to lead us in the pledge. They include Amelia Butler, Aiden Butler, Kevin Grants, Aiden Hill, Hannah Markle, Christian Menker, Eric Piatkowski, Zoe Tope, John Turner, and Braden Van Dalsen. If you all can come up and gather around the microphone and lead us into the, in the pledge, would be great. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I stand pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Next we have the approval of the agenda. May I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move approval of the agenda as presented. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. The agenda is approved. Next is um, attendance. <laughs> Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Dr. Beers. Aye. Here. Ms. Hummel. Here. Mr. Kelly. Here. Ms. Ownby. Here. Mrs. Taylor. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Ms. Cook. Here. Thank you. Now we have announcements and superintendent's report. Dr. Heron. Thank you. I guess now I can hear myself. <clears throat> I'll start uh, the second part again. On March 3rd, WJCC students participated in the 67th Annual Tidewater Science Fair held at Old Dominion University. Our students had a wonderful experience interacting with business professionals and college professors in their projects fields of study. We look forward to having even more students participate next year. And recently, the STEM Club at Lafayette High School had the opportunity to meet with skilled professionals from Newport News Shipbuilding. The presenters discussed STEM careers and allowed club members a chance to experience cutting-edge engineering technology. Students were shown how 3D, 3D models can be made using laser scanning and were given a chance to use the latest version of the Microsoft Augmented Reality Virtual Desktop, desktop Helmet. The helmet, called the hollow lens, was used to manipulate objects in the, in the room in which they were standing. These are just three examples of the most recent exciting educational opportunities our high school students have experienced. 
And this is not only just happening in high schools. At Norge Elementary, students recently learned about tools of the trade for chefs and construction workers, and had a special guest share how roads are built. Clara Bird Baker Elementary and Hornsby Middle recently hosted uh, career fairs that brought in speakers from a wide variety of professions. And Laura Lane Elementary students recently were visited by a former WJCC student, now a doctor, who emphasized to students how important reading is to his current success. Thank you to teachers and school staff members who organize these wonderful activities and to the community partners who partner with us to provide our students with real world exposure to current topics and future careers. Those are all of the announcements I have this evening, Madam Chair. Dr. Heron, for the listening public who didn't get the message today earlier about the weather, do you want to share that today as well? Uh, just to mention that apparently the snow was on the way again, uh, even though it is officially spring. Uh, school will start as normal tomorrow morning, but we would ask all parents uh, and families to please watch for a message in case due to deteriorating conditions we end up having to leave school early tomorrow afternoon. So please watch for the, the Twitter and news uh, on the web, etc. Thank you. Are there any other announcements? And that moves us uh, to the next item, which is board recognitions. <coughs> Madam Chair, tonight we have a number of individuals to recognize. Let's begin by congratulating the Jamestown Scholastic Bowl team for being named the 2018 WHSL 4A State Champions. Scholastic Bowl pits four-person teams in a test of knowledge of English, math, science, social studies, and miscellaneous areas like current events, entertainment, the arts, and sports. Jamestown competed against the top eight schools for the championship. Students, as your name is called, please come forward and remain for a group photograph. <clears throat> David Bass. Ulyava. <clears throat> Jeffrey Shi, <laughs> Finn Hulse, <laughs> Pearson Shemengar, <laughs> Zach Clevenger, <laughs> Joseph Kang. Lisa Small, and Jessica Shi. And if I could ask the, the very proud coaches, Ryan Gross and Chris Ames, to please join the students at the front of the room for photograph. <laughs> Well done, state champions. <clears throat> the 
National Merit Scholarship Program recognizes less than 1% of seniors nationwide for their exceptional scores on the PSAT during their junior year. Finalists for this honor are selected based upon their academic record, participation in school and community activities, demonstrated leadership abilities, employment, and honors awards received. Tonight, we are honored to recognize a Jamestown student for being named a 2018 National Merit Finalist. Nathaniel or Nate Baker, please join us to be recognized. If I could just mention one of our senior staff members is a very proud father tonight, Mr. <laughs> Tim Baker. I sure can. Mr. Baker, come and have your photograph taken, please. <laughs> Amy, do you want to join us too? join me in congratulating three Warhill athletes for being named to the All-State field hockey team. Unfortunately, two of the young ladies could not join us because of other athletic commitments this evening, but we will call each of their names to recognize this wonderful oh, accomplishment. Are they are here? Oh, excellent. <laughs> Megan Cretney. <laughs> Braylon Lassiter. Delaney Snyder. And Coach Boykin, if you can join Delaney and the other two ladies up front, that would be great for a photograph. Thank you. You can give them to me. Very well done. Next, next, we recognize Lafayette field hockey athletes who were named to the National Field Hockey Coaches Association's high school academic squad. This program recognizes high school juniors and seniors who've achieved an unweighted cumulative grade point average of 3.50 out of 4.0 throughout the first quarter of this school year. Students, as your names are called, please come to the front. Jackie Basler. Bree Gillen. Claire Kennis. Isabella Molina. Kayla Nordeman. Carly Orlowski. <laughs> Lauren Roth. <laughs> Ali Turon. <laughs> and Laura Walker. And Coach Enstrom will please join the team members at the front. Uh, can, impressive accomplishment, ladies. Well done.
As a former field hockey coach, I'm really impressed with this one. <laughs> Well done, girls. <laughs> now we turn our attention to several outstanding teachers within the school division. The WJCC School Teachers of the Year program allows us to pay tribute to teachers who are, who are exceptionally skilled, dedicated, and who demonstrate excellence in the classroom. Each school's Teacher of the Year is selected by peers for their outstanding classroom instruction and leadership. These teachers embody WJCC's core values of individualism, integrity, innovation, accountability, and collaboration. I'm extremely proud to congratulate this year's Teachers of the Year. Teachers, as your name is called, please come up front and stay for a group photograph. Bright Beginnings Teacher of the Year, Crystal Glisson. Clara Bird, Teacher of the Year. Jason Kreiner. <laughs> DJ Montague, Teacher of the Year. Diana Giuseppe. J. Blaine Blayton, Teacher of the Year, Kate Sykes. <clears throat> James River, Teacher of the Year, Ashley Lee. Laurel Lane, Teacher of the Year, Suzanne Sylvester. <laughs> Atoka, Teacher of the Year, Maureen McFarland. Matthew Whaley, Teacher of the Year, Millie Pegram. <laughs> Norge, Teacher of the Year, Anne Evans. Stonehouse Teacher of the Year, Robin LaCase. <laughs> Berkeley Teacher of the Year, Doug Ernst. S. Hornsby Teacher of the Year, Jessica Napier. <clears throat> Tuano Teacher of the Year, Elizabeth Williams. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Elizabeth is, wasn't able to be with us this evening because of a family emergency. <clears throat> Jamestown High School Teacher of the Year, Harvey Stone.
Lafayette High Teacher of the Year, Stephen Legowick. <laughs> Warhill High Teacher of the Year, Shannon Williams. <laughs> Congratulations again, teachers. We really appreciate all you do to help our students and, and schools be so successful. Thank you. I'm going to take a photograph of the teachers first. So if you gather around, and then I'm going to ask the principals to come up and join your staff for the second photograph. <laughs> well done, Harvey. Thank you. Good job. You guys get in there. Betsy? Betsy? You need to be in. Oh, sorry. One on each side, please. Yes. Principals, do you want to join us for a photograph <coughs> with your wonderful teachers? Madam Chair, that concludes our recognitions for this down. evening. We look forward to more uh, recognitions at the next meeting. Thank you. You know, they're all going to beat Pete out of here.
it. See, I told him to do it. I told him to do it. Blame me. All right. Just letting you know. Are we ready? Thank you. Right. Glad you recognized it. <laughs> Heron, would you like to introduce the school spotlight? Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Dr. Stam, proud principal of J.B. Blayton Elementary, to introduce our school spotlight this evening. Thank you, Dr. Stam. Thank you, board members, Madam Chair, Superintendent Dr. Heron. We are so excited to have our students here to present to you tonight. We are fortunate that Cheryl Holshue, our gifted resource teacher at JBB, had a vision and that the WJCC Schools Foundation supported that vision by giving her a grant for the little bits. And so now we're gonna turn on our video and then we'll have a great demonstration for you. Cool coding with little bits by little bees at the hive. Here at the Hive, little bees in grades third, fourth, and fifth are learning to build circuits, create code, and build inventions with little bits. What are little bits? Little bits are cool electronic building blocks that are magnetic and snap together. With them, we get to use our wonderful imaginations to create, design, and code inventions. The little bits invention cycle helps us work through the creative process. First we get to create, which is great. Next we get to play, and we wish we could all day. Remix is next, which is the best. We get to mix it all up. At the end, we get to share. We listen to our peers to show we care. Hello world is an important tradition in coding. Whenever someone learns to code, the very first coding program they create and code is to say hello to the world. Hello world explorer. Creative remixing. Look and listen to all of the creative coding we have done in the past four weeks. Thank you, WJCC Foundation, for our little bits. Here are some of my students who created and coded, Guess My Number Math Game, The Ultimate Soccer Game, and Structures. Enjoy! us to come to you. <laughs> it's what we call teamwork. <laughs> okay, we can all breathe. Group that's presented. 
No, he's, they're good. But they're fine. Good. Great job, you guys.
difficulty with the servos. So the tree's supposed to spin, but today we've tried four different servos on it, and we've <laughs> just had some problems. We haven't been able to figure it totally out. Guess the number. <coughs> Put in nine and output sixteen. Yes? Seven. Seven? Mm -hmm. Hey, <laughs> seven. <laughs> Mr. Butler. Mr. Butler, are you gonna input seven? Does anyone have any comments or questions for Ms. Yeah, Ms. Worth? Safe. Any questions? Well, thank you so much. And thank you, WJCC Foundation. And your talents with us. We really appreciate it. That brings us to citizens' comments. How many cards do we have, Ms. Andy? We have two cards. Um, Ms. Hummel, will you please read the uh, sure. instructions? Thank you. Um, this is the time when citizens who have submitted speaker cards are invited to address the board. Speakers are asked to come to the podium when their names are called, state their name for the record, and direct their comments to the chair of the board. Each speaker is allocated three minutes, and time cannot be yielded to another speaker. Personnel matters are not discussed in open school board meetings, and we ask that you refrain from making reference to specific individuals. The board is interested in hearing all comments fully and requests that citizens refrain from verbal outbursts, applause, or any other type of de demonstration. Although the board does not respond to comments at this time, please know that we are listening and we appreciate your time. Thank you for adhering to these guidelines. Madam Chair, my directions are concluded.
Thank you. And Ms. Serza, the clerk of our board, asked me to let the speakers know that when the yellow light is blinking, that means there's 30 seconds left. Is that correct? Okay, so. Tim Hunley. <coughs> Good evening, Kim Hundley, president of the Teachers Education Association. So it's Ma March Madness, if you're watching TV. <laughs> it's been pretty quiet on the educational home front. Wanted to thank you. Um, most of all of our members are very pleased with the thoughtful um, comments you all had made and um, towards the budget. We're very excited about the 3% that was presented. And um, we're very hopeful as well. So as you know, um, we're thinking green, not just for St. Patrick's Day, but for money. And um, like I said, we're very hopeful. And I want to also publicly thank you um, for supporting the teachers all the time. We have really felt the support. And I wanted to have a special thank you to uh, Mr. Thorpe, who came um, on uh, Read Across America to my classroom to show my children how to um, to curl and two children got the stone on the home so we just wanted to say how much we appreciate not only the board but the staff I mean to take time from his day to come and he was so excited and so I wanted to include that in as you were talking about the wonderful things going on in the school so um, we'll wait to see what happens in the General Assembly but as we said we're really hopeful thank you thank you Ms. Hunley Robert Wilson Albert Einstein is credited with the statement, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing repeatedly and expecting different results. The gun-free zone that has been in effect since 1990 in the Florida has shown us that it does not work. We have been doing the same thing over and over for 28 years with politicians and administrators expecting a different result. Unfortunately, there is a troubled individual in the, in the community somewhere, as evidenced yesterday, that is seeing this coverage 24-7 on news media and is saying, why not me? At least I would be famous. Suicide by cop is what my answer is. The Crime Research Prevention Center looked at every mass shooting since 1950 through 2016. They found that a staggering 98.4% happened in gun-free zones. If we limit that range from 1998 to 2016, we still have a 96.2% mass shooting in gun-free zones. This information is from an article debating the gun grabbers on gun control by John Crump, posted February 16, 2016, Amelant, Amelant Incorporated. In 2013, NBC News inves investigations found there are 18 states that allow schools, personnel, administrators, teachers, school employees to carry a firearm on school grounds with proper authorization. The state of Virginia has methods for school boards to have security personnel to carry concealed on campuses. There are training programs available, such as the Faculty Administrator Safety Training and Emergency Response Program, FASTER. These programs also provide trauma medical training for school employees that may not want to carry firearms, but do want to help in case of a worst case scenario. Quick response by armed school employees is the quickest and safest way to stop a mass murder in our school. My request to the school board, one, discontinue gun safety zone in all JCC schools. Two, hire 
or work with present employees that are willing to Thank successfully you, Mr. Wilson. complete we appreciate your training and carry. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. I have a, a copy of these that I'll leave with them, and they'll, I'll have to get three of them to you. Ms. Serza will share that with us. Thank you. All right, there are no more speaker cards. Thank you. That brings us to the consent agenda. Item 7.01, approval of minutes from the following meetings, February 20th, 2018 and March 6, 2018. 7.02, financial report and monthly bills and payroll from February 2018. Personnel actions as presented. 7.04, resolution R-9-18, month of the military child. 7.05, re resolution R-11-18, BSBA business honor roll. 7.06, new policy IGBF limited English proficient students. 7.07, .07, retire policy INH class interruptions. 7.08, retire policy JHA student insurance program. 7.09, retire policy JHFD student automobile use. And 7.10, new policy JHCE recommendation of medication by school personnel. May I please have a motion? I move that we uh, approve the consent agenda as presented. Thank you, Ms. Hummel. May I have a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, is there any discussion? It's been moved and seconded. There's no discussion. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly? Aye. Ms. Ownby? Aye. Mrs. Taylor? Aye. Mrs. Young? Aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Hummel? Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Thank you. The consent agenda passes. That brings us to information items and non-action items this evening. The first is the presentation on New Horizons Regional Education Center. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Mr. Joe Johnson, Director of New Horizons Re Regional Education Center, to provide an update uh, for the board on the center. Thank you very much and welcome, Mr. Johnson. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, superintendent. Thank you very much. Uh, it is good to be here to provide an update in terms of New Horizons uh, Regional Education Center. As you know, we serve the six school divisions on the greater peninsula, 21 different high schools. Um, and on the first side, these are the various programs we offer. But on the first side, I do want to point out one that most people don't know of, and that is the New Horizons William and Mary Family Counseling Center. Uh, for individuals or families who need counseling services but cannot afford such. Uh, in terms of our regional special education program, we have two uh, programs, the Newport Academy and the Center for Autism. You can see you projected 23 students to be served this year and you had a high 22 enrollment, so right on target, and it is uh, split between the two uh, special ed programs that we offer. The majority of the evening, I wanted to spend talking about the uh, career and technical education programs we offer in our five-year master plan. We are moving from a uh, current model, uh, which is an education-driven model, to a new model design, employer-driven. Uh, we had a consultant who came in and helped us set this up, and I'll elaborate as we go through. But an employer-driven, employer input is very different than saying we want to offer programs for students and fill seats. It is about what are the jobs and what are the high demand needs. So just to give you a little overview, we have two campuses. One is next to the um, Thomas Nelson Community College in Hampton, and the other is next to Woodside Lane High School at Fort Eustis. Uh, we're serving about 1,000 students on the peninsula in career and technical programs, 90% had a credential pass rate, 70% are going to post-secondary education either full-time or part-time. Uh, and I'm going to spend some time talking about employment. Uh, and it is a half-day program. They're at their home school half a day and at New Horizons half a day. So we have seven career clusters that we offer. One of the new initiatives under the master plan was to renovate the Woodside Lane campus, which is closest to, to Williamsburg, and to begin to offer and to fill that center with programs that would benefit the Upper Peninsula. So what you can see is we're also clustering programs 
to campus based on the employment in the area. So construction technology, personal services, and information technology is at Woodside Lane and uh, with some other programs. So just to go through them quick, we have automotive technology, as you can imagine, automotive technician and auto collision. Construction technology will next year be fully at the Woodside Lane campus with electrical, carpentry, and HVAC. Engineering and manufacturing technology, this is pretty exciting. Uh, this last year, we started a megatronics program uh, in mechanical and electrical uh, technical program, and uh, they earned, it's actually taught by Thomas Nelson, they earned 22 college dual enrollment credits in one year, um, and that they transfer on, and they come out with semen certification. Our, uh, one of the most popular programs is our welding program. Next year, we are proposing a precision machining program uh, that would be taught by Thomas Nelson at Continental. That's pretty good, actually be taught in the workplace. Uh, and uh, an automation and mechanical production uh, program for manufacturing. In health sciences, we have an array of programs, and just at the Woodside Lane campus, we have pharmacy technician, vet science. Next year, we're going to be opening up a PTOT program. I can already tell you it's packed. Uh, anything we open up in health science is pretty full, uh, so we're pretty excited about that. Personal services, cosmetology, culinary arts are always packed, and this next year we're moving early childhood education to the Woodside Lane campus, uh, and we have an elementary school right next to us, so this is a great opportunity, plus our special ed center. Information technology, two programs this year that are pretty exciting. Williamsburg enrolled, a, I think, like 16 students in these programs. We have a Cisco networking cybersecurity program, um, which is taught by a Cisco certified instructor and receives dual enrollment, as well as computer programming applications and gaming. So I want those fifth graders that were here tonight to be coming to this program because they would really love it. Um, these are two new exciting, oh, and the IT cluster is going to be um, focused at the Woodside Lane campus as well. Um, public service is EMT, fire science, and criminal justice. But what I want to talk just briefly about is a new academy we set up for construction, automotive, and manufacturing. It is called the Advanced Technical Careers Academy. This was the outbirth of the uh, master plan. It is an employer-driven council. They can actually bring forth ideas directly to the superintendents and to the board members. Um, and what the first thing they did was say, well, what is your student profile? And we said, well, don't sure we had a student profile. We try to bring in all the students who want to come to the program. Well, that doesn't mean that just because students want to come that we would want to employ them. And so they're really focused on being sure we get students prepared in attendance, discipline, uh, the GPA, and what is needed for employment. So we turned this in reverse to the employers and said, we need you up front. So we brought in 15 employers who have met with students, presented about their companies, and have agreed to hire students if they did the work uh, and finish school, um, the programs, their, their technical training programs. I am pleased to say on May 1, we're going to have a signing day. We're making this like sports. Let's, let's promote getting a job, going to work, and being independent as much as we promote getting a scholarship for athletics. Uh, and for those who are going on to post-secondary training or college, that is wonderful. But what about those we call going for the good life solution? That means you get your own apartment, your car, live independent on your own with no college debt, and then maybe employers will pay for your college along the way. We have 28 students who have already been interviewed and offered employment by employees, employers. We believe that number will go up. And on May 1, we're going to have a signing day with the parents, the students, and the employers where they declare where they want to be employed. These are a lot of our employers who are on the business council. Um, as you can see, we focus on dual enrollment. 
Um, the, do, the enrollment of Williamsburg James City County has been around 75. It's been in the 70s. Under the leadership of Dr. Heron next year, uh, this idea just came out in a meeting. What, what Would it be possible for students to come in the afternoon and not just the morning? Oh, because they're having to get up at like 5 in the morning to catch the buses to get down. And would it be possible to come in the afternoon? And we're going to accommodate that. And um, so we'll see how that goes over the next couple of years. So thank you for your leadership on that. Now, here's why it was important I talked about the clusters at Woodside Lane. Of your enrollment, human services, construction, and information technology, your three highest areas, are all going to be clustered at Woodside Lane. And so that is the closest campus to this division, which reduces travel time. Now, if students want to go to the other programs naturally, that would be available, but it is of benefit to have those programs closest um, to Williamsburg. I just briefly want to talk about the Governor's School for Science and Technology. When I was here eight years ago, your enrollment in the Governor's School was zero. Zero. You were six out of all school divisions. Right now, you have 30 two students enrolled in the governor's school and you're second only to York. Uh, so through the leadership and the encouragement of participating in the governor's school, it is the state gifted high school program. Our focus is really on honors, research, mentorship. Uh, students are getting 20 to 40 dual enrollment credits. They're going 98% are accepted in top tier universities. And of the 90 graduates last year, they received over 8 million dollars in scholarship award. It is truly a rigorous and an advanced program. Um, the three strands are computational science, biological science, and um, engineering. I bypassed that. Engineering. Um, but our big focus is also in having the math. We're now up to offering differential equations. You'd have to go to CNU to get that. Um, Honors research and mentorship is just incredible where they get to go out in the field and conduct actual research and then present that in front of a business panel. Uh, most do, or the research that is being done is something you would get in later years of, a, um, of your undergraduate program or ma a master's program. So just to highlight a few, you have Megan Roberts out of Lafayette that's at R Riverside Regional Medical Center. Uh, Jesse Nelson is at Langley. Um, you have Elizabeth Horley is at College of William & Mary Physics Department, and I could go on and on. You also did well, oh, that took off. You also did well in the Regional High School Mathematics Competition. Your team out of Williamsburg placed second, and you had some outstanding individual achievements. But the focus at New Horizons, oh, and just to show you, you are your highest area is in computational, computational science and engineering. So at New Horizons, our tagline is, we are about, and I love when people ask me, what do you do? Uh, and I don't get to say I'm in education. I get to say I illuminate minds, ignite passions, and shape futures. And that's what we do at New Horizons, and especially about igniting those passions and shaping futures. And in career and technical, we are really blooming and growing, and uh, we have a lot more room to even expand in. The master plan also calls for us to move then, after the, this phase, uh, into a early full-day early college program, uh, possibly a full-day early careers program, uh, as well as online offerings. So. That's sort of an update on New Horizons, and we want to thank Mr. Kelly, who represents the uh, board on our board of trustees and is actually our vice chair. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Kelly, do you have any? Uh, sure. <coughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Johnson, for coming tonight and, and, uh, and briefing everyone on the on New Horizons and, and the great resource it really is for our students um, and, and actually the broad spectrum of offerings there. I really... Um, I was really appreciative of you know the business council that we started that you started and and, and brought uh, businesses in. Okay, what are you looking for? And and um, you know it was really kind of a good introspective of, of of the students that were coming there for CTE and and actually their ability to be employed. 
And so, um, so them, them delineating the standard and us turning around and saying, okay, uh, time to put up or shut up, folks. You know, if you're gonna get help, want this standard, then we want you to employ our students. And so, uh, I think that was that was um, a great initiative, and and uh, really appreciative of that. Um, you know, it really shows that we're we're listening to our customers, and and because our customers really are not only our students, but also the businesses that those those students go out to. So, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate. It. I don't know if you want to expand any more about about that business partnership that you have, and, and all the folks that you had involved in that. Well, I think it is it is wonderful to have business who came in. One, we had to get the businesses who come to table saying they'd be willing to hire high school graduates. That's a risky proposition. It's, you know, they're not sure high school graduates exactly what they're going to do or how long they'll be with them or is it worth the training, but you have to begin growing and supporting the technical programs. And we had employers say, without a doubt, we will hire high school graduates. And they are doing that. And uh, the students are learning. You, can, you have to uh, have good attendance. You have to have um, a wonderful respect in the work area, in the school, uh, and, your, and your grades and your competency scores have to be good. So we had to ask a lot of students to leave the room. They couldn't interview with employees. And then the students wanted to know, well, how do I get back in the room? Then it became real. Well, if you get your attendance right, we get the discipline under control, or we get the grades up, then we can put you back in front of employers. So it began to set a real standard, uh, and the employers appreciated that because they knew we had done screening based on their profile to begin with. Right, and it's not just the students that are in the program now, but it's the students who, are, who, are, who wish to attain to, the, to get into the program who realize, okay, wait a second, some of the stuff that really matters. You know, um, you know, the hardest part about you know, going to work is showing up, right? So attendance, right. attendance matters. Uh, discipline matters, so I think all that's all that's uh, great. Um, you know, th and there's a lot of exciting things going on in New Horizons with the renovation of the Woodside Lane campus that's and, be and, nice. and things uh, moving towards that direction. And, I, and that us on the upper end of the peninsula, obviously, that's going to be a real help to us. So um, the Governor School, I, uh, enough can't be said about that. Uh, I know the honors uh, research and mentoring. Uh, you know, just listen to some of the topics and. And you're, this is high school kids that are doing right. this. I mean, it's it's uh, these these students are really very impressive, and it's and it's uh, uh, kind of impressive to watch, and a little humbling too, to, of the way way these students are. So, um, so I, anyway, thank you for coming tonight, and uh, this might be one of the last times you come to us. Will be the last. <laughs> <laughs> I'll retire in August. So. so, so um, Mr. Johnson's retiring in August, and uh, really appreciate your, your service to uh, New Horizons and, and by extension at WJCC. Yeah. So I just want to uh, add um, my uh, thank you because one of the things um, you, you had a couple of things that I think are really important those work skills that, that not even the job itself, but just getting to work on time and being there. And then and the, the second part of that is being respectful. Um, my, my son was hired at McDonald's and, and uh, learned very quickly that, that, that uh, when you punch out of there uh, when you don't, you're not respectful and he lost his job because he wasn't respectful. So that, I think that is so critical. But thank you so much for doing this for uh, WJCC students because we have great students and, and these are opportunities for them if they can get to work on time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the one thing I would also point out that I think students are learning is just because you're in automotive or just because you're in welding or just because you're in electrical or whatever the field is, um, that doesn't mean that's where you're going to work. So we have uh, students who, who are welding students who decided after listening to employers speak, they wanted to be in HVAC. Uh, and so they, they switched careers options versus their training. What a learning experience. It's best to learn at this age what you do not want to do as much as it is what you want to do. And so uh, that's what you're offering your students. And I thank the superintendent, the staff here, and the board for uh, being such a great player and supporting the regional efforts. And Ms. Hummel, thank you for your time on the board. I want to segue Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson for his service, because how many years have you
worked at New Horizons. This is my 13th year at New Thir Horizons, yes. 13 years you've seen a lot of progress, and I just wanted wonderful. to thank you for all the time, and then also say that I'm super encouraged to hear that maybe we're looking at an afternoon option for students, because yes, having a high school student have to catch a bus at 5.30 in the morning in order to take advantage of some of these opportunities is a lot to ask. So I think whatever creative um, options that we can do uh, to increase our participation uh, in this career tech area will be uh, back to us as a benefit. Zombie? Yes, I have two questions and then a comment. You mentioned earlier that some of the programs are full or as soon as you create a new program, it's full. So is there a waiting list or are there programs that students want to participate in but, but can't because of capacity? Correct. Um, so for example, um, if you take like a pharmacy tech, vet science, dental assistant, any of the healthcare programs, um, culinary arts, they're all full uh, and will actually have a waiting list. It, and um, and so students begin to um, um, compete from the divisions because we keep divisions at a similar level. Uh, some will increase, some will decrease each from year to year, uh, but they're full. Uh, then there are programs where we are trying to build enrollment, which is related to the academy and the trades, because um, that's really where uh, a strong workforce on the peninsula is. And uh, I don't think a lot of students or folks appreciate that or understand it. A follow-up question. So as you are, are filling those positions um, and you're kind of keeping the ratios in, in check so that each division is, has the same number of students, are you looking- Within reason. Within reason. Are you looking primarily at GPA? Is it kind of a holistic approach? Like, since it's so competitive, how, which students get selected? <laughs> we look at it in a couple of ways. One is GPA, one of it is attendance, um, and the other part of it is, is trying to understand whether we feel we have a student who is um, really motivated and has this uh, as an interest as a career, or is this just an elective and something to do? Um, so we're trying to look at also their, their ability, but we do have a whole screening mechanism we look at. And then, so WJCC has kind of hovered in the 70s, about 70 students have participated. What is our our top number without it impacting the only. budget? Thank you, good question, right there it is. So, the campus that has the space to grow is Woodside Lane, because we just reven renovated it and moved a lot of special education services out of it. So it's gonna be a full-blown campus growing um, from what has been around 300 to approximately 600 students. So the growth for Williamsburg and the opportunity for the growth is very good. Um, and especially as we add new programs, um, then, then I think that's, you'll, you'll begin to see that opportunity. Um, thank you, and then just wanted to echo Ms. Hummel, um, totally concur. I think that, that a barrier here to four has definitely been that, that 5.30 a.m. bus ride, so that's huge. Um, I'm very excited to see that switch to the afternoon. Karen, did you have anything to add? I just want to thank Mr. Johnson publicly for his leadership of uh, New Horizons Regional Education Center. I've really enjoyed working with you and really appreciate all of the work you've done over the years. Thank you, sir. Anything else? Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for your service. That brings us to um, discussion of the fiscal year uh, 2019 operating budget. And before we begin discussing, I th uh, Mr. Kelly and I have some things we'd like to say. Mr. Kelly? As a member of the school board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge I have an interest in the fiscal year 2018-19 school budget because my wife is an employee of WJCC schools. However, I believe that I am able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. Thank you, and I would also like to add that as a member of the School Board of Williamsburg, James City County, I acknowledge that I have an interest in the fiscal year 2018-2019 school budget because I'm an employee of the Williamsburg Health Foundation. However, I believe I'm able to participate in the consideration of and vote on the budget fairly and in the public interest. So with that, um, Dr. Heron has presented to us her proposal.
proposed budget and it is before us this evening uh, later on the agenda for a vote if we at, through this discussion that we're about to have get to a point where we're able to take action later in the meeting we will if we if we're not able to do that we have a placeholder meeting a week from today um, which would be set aside just for the sole purpose of taking action on the budget if we're not in a place where we can do that tonight so um, with that just as a reminder um, the uh, Actually, Dr. Heron, do you have anything to add before we begin discussion? I forgot to ask you that before. Oh, ma'am. Okay, thank you. We uh, discussed at the last meeting possibly adding or uh, uh, adjusting the budget to include uh, a finance position. And then also we got asked for information on the cost of adding security guards. And so I think we kind of, we have three topics to discuss tonight. Uh, the first would be that finance position. I think the second would be security guards and then the third would be if we add any of that do we take anything out so I think those are kind of the three topics so with that I will toss it to my colleagues and see if anyone wants to um, so actually I'm going to throw this over to Dr. Heron um, the we received uh, a request from um, Clarence Wilson, who is the president of the WJCC Foundation, uh, the, the organization that raises the grants for the innovation grants for the school system. And he has requested um, some administrative support from the school division. And if you could explain like what you think would be um, an appropriate uh, response uh, in the budget to to his request. Um, basically, I know the board is already considering a position for a very different purpose. Uh, from what I understand, Mr. Wilson has requested approximately 15 hours a week of administrative support in the memorandum, memorandum of understanding between the foundation and the school board that was set up three years ago. There is an understanding that if needed, the board could choose to provide a level of, of administrative support. And if the board were to um, add the finance position, there may be an opportunity at the board's will to carve out a, a piece of that position to help the foundation with their administrative support. Uh, they had a grant for three years and got administrative support through that, the functions of that grant that no longer exists and they're unable to, well, to continue in the same mode without some level of support from somewhere. The only thing I would add to that, Ms. Hummel, is that the MOU that this board has with the foundation allows for um, support uh, and and that what that looks like I think is um, an administrative decision so I think that from our perspective um, it's it's good to know that if we decide to add the position in um, that would allow supplemental pay uh, mid-month for employees who are, are essentially our lowest paid employees um, that 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 would also uh, allow uh, Dr. Heron to have the resources to provide uh, that request. But, um, but at the end of the day, it's an administrative decision because the MOU has already been adopted by the board and our board and their board, if that makes any sense. And then my understanding is if we were to move forward with this, that it, it would be a situation where we would see how it see how it goes that possible or is it and then with the idea that this uh, the carving out of 15 hours a week would um, that that person would be reporting to the administration I think all of the finer details would would be decided if a position were actually available um, 
I do know the memorandum of understanding with the board is up for renewal, I believe in September, and there's an opportunity to revisit the, the terms of the memorandum of un understanding if the board so chooses at that time. And so if you did want to have uh, some review of the work that had been done administratively for the foundation, we could certainly provide the board with a report at that time on the number of hours that it actually took to support their very basic administrative needs. Tom will open the conversation with that finance position and the potential support that would be provided to the foundation. Does anyone have anything to add about that particular topic? So, so the, uh, the finance position to allow for the mid-month um, payments for the bus drivers, custodial staff, cafeteria workers, those types of folks would also be the same position that would support the foundation? Is that um, just suggesting to the board there may be an opportunity to take a very small slice of that position or a piece of that position to support the foundation. Uh, there's not a lot of opportunity in current staffing to support the foundation because uh, administratively we are very thin on the ground and people have, you know, 100% work right now. Right. So, so um, you know, the, found, the foundation started three years, three years ago, I think is how long has it's been there. And um, they did have the grant for the, for the admin staff from the Ferguson Foundation, I think is what it was. My understanding they've had it from the beginning. So, so uh, uh, I think the good work that the foundation, I, re I mean, I really think it's important that, that we, do, we do support the foundation and um, you know, the, the, the good work that they have done for our teachers and the innovation grants and, and uh, the community involvement as well as uh, teacher engagement, I think, I think is uh, well worth the investment of 15 hours um, a week. So the other, uh, the, the uh, position as far as supporting the finance, um, we used to do this twice a month. Is that correct? Ms. Barnes can provide details, having got them from historically from other staff members and looked at some of the records of the amount of overtime that we used to actually make the twice a month payment happen, Ms. Barnes. Good evening, Chairman, uh, Madam Chairman, and other board members, and Dr. Aaron. Uh, Mr. Kelly, yes. Actually, uh, when the payroll was con conducting the two payrolls a month, uh, they were accruing 1,400 hours of, of overtime each year, and uh, it was to the cost of more than $32,500, and also the wear and tear of the uh, the employees you know, putting in the time. Um, the see else I needed to add to that oh too I'm sorry about this I, I I was also advised that prior to 2012 there actually was a finance clerk in the finance department and when there were budget cuts of course that was one of the positions that was eliminated so I'm sure that helped the process I was under the impression that, and this was with Miss Berta, that mm -hmm. they did away with the uh, twice a month of uh, implementation system. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? That that's correct. Uh, you have to remember, though, that we went live with this financial system in April. And so there's still a learning curve, and we're actually still putting in a little bit of overtime, just trying to reconcile that. So there's you've got the learning curve with payroll and and with HR. Um, we hope to see some efficiencies, but uh, you know as of yet, we haven't appreciated any. I think that was, to, as I recall, that it was part of the rollout of that new system that somehow the system. Couldn't automatically. I can I can probably speak to that. I think a choice was made at the time oh, okay. to go to once once a month because of the amount of overtime okay. of staff, and so a decision was made to go to once a month. 
And then only after the decision was made, I think the impact on, us, on some of our employees became very evident very quickly, and we haven't been able to resolve that since. Yes, yeah, because so, it's been a couple of years since we've done that, isn't it? Yes, sir. Hasn't it been a couple of years since? But payroll was just implemented in April. So we rolled right, the new, out the, the financial new payroll system. system was this yes, from April because the old payroll system Correct. was unstable and uh, Correct. it was duct tape and tie wire keeping it together and so it was green screens and yes yeah, sir which which on in payroll is not something that you need right you want a, you want a stable and robust system uh, but it would seem with a, with a new system that you could that you could get there without too much difficulty I would think but I don't. We haven't we haven't seen those efficiencies yet. Okay, and the finance clerk when when did the finance clerk go away? It was before 2012. I don't okay. have the exact date. That was kind of that was kind of um, so after the finance clerk went away is when we started is, is when we started spending the 1400 overtime or was it before that that no, we were I, doing? I believe the finance clerk actually served finance and then okay. uh, itself and payroll was putting in the additional uh, oh, overtime. Gotcha. Okay. So. Bottom line, at some uh, oh sorry, Dr. Beers. Oh no, sorry, <laughs> yeah, Dr. Beers. Me? Thank you. Um, I, I've, I've got several things to say. I guess the first thing, the first question I have is, I'm not quite sure why why do these two things have to be linked together? They why do we have to, uh, you know, wherever the 15 hours is, why does that why does that have to be connected to whether we pay somebody once a month or somebody twice a month? I'm, Dr. Beers, they really don't have they to, aren't. They don't so have to why are, be together. We're, we're, we, we seem to, to talk like they're connected, and but you're saying they're not, right? They don't have to be, sir. Okay. Um, the other, I guess the other thing I, I, would, I would suggest, um, I'm perfectly willing to uh, vote for the overall operational budget, but I think we need to delay a vote on um, this additional support that's been requested. Um, by the foundation. I think there needs to be more discussion. I think we need to consult with our attorney um, so that we understand the implications of giving tax dollars to an organization um, over which we have virtually no control, no control. I was actually surprised. I went into the, our policy section of um, our, our, our um, Board manual, um, and the word educational foundation is nowhere in there. Um, I am concerned, I was always concerned when I read that initial um, um, uh, memorandum of uh, uh, the DMOU, is that, um, and I've looked at foundations that other school divisions have, and one of the things that's very clear with all those foundations is the phrase with the approval of the school board. And um, we don't, we're never in a position to approve anything um, un under that um, uh, MOU at the time. And um, um, I am also concerned that we do have a tight budget this year. Um, and we're going to ask for more money. And those are going to come out of tax dollars. And I am just um, uneasy about seeking additional funds for a foundation that we have no control over to um, um, pay for its administrative costs. I can't think of, of a foundation that I've been associated with um, over the years that um, has ever said, we are going to give away 100% of all the money that we take in. They always build in their administrative costs. I understand that they have been, from looking at um, uh, some of the information about the foundation, that uh, money has, they have spent money for marketing, they have spent money for development. Now, what I don't know, and it's probably the, we, the reason they have been able to do that is because they have used funds that were part of that initial three-year grant. I don't know. See, I don't know a lot about the foundation. Um, and um, and um, I, 
Um, and you know, and, and I know some of the members of the board may be upset with some of the things that I'm saying, but um, I, I just think that uh, we, need, we need some time to look at this a little more closely, especially the implications for that. Now, if it means, um, you, you know, now if I don't have support for that, um, then I would be willing to consider a compromise. And the compromise would be, okay, for the next, what, six months, we'll provide that additional support. I don't agree with it, I don't support it. And then when it's time to revisit that um, uh, MOU um, in September, then we take a really close look at the language of that uh, memorandum and, um, um, and deal with it at that time. I certainly support the work that the foundation does. Um, and the excitement and the, um, and the joy and the thanks that, that our teachers feel uh, when they have the opportunity to, uh, to win one of those grants. So I, I'm trying to keep those two things separate because I think they are separate. And, and I do think that the foundation, I, you know, I don't think it's too strong, needs to get its fiscal house in order the way other foundations have had to, other nonprofits have had to do. Um, so um, um, that's my feeling about that. And, and um, you know, I've, I'll, I'll let, I would like to hear what other board members have to say about that. Before we turn it to, I just want to kind of clarify a few things. Um, so I, I, I take your point, Dr. Beers, but just to clarify, uh, it is not unusual or unheard of for divisions to provide that sort of support for other foundations, and I think staff can share some examples of where that is, how I'm things... Sorry, I'm sorry, say that again? It is not abnormal or unusual for school divisions to provide that sort of administrative a support. Absolutely right. Does that make it correct? Additionally, I think it's important to understand that we ha did, this body did approve an MOU, and we will look at it later this year, but that MOU was within this body's purview and clearly allows Dr. Heron to provide administrative support. So that decision's already been the made. The language I saw in the original um, memorandum of understanding was simply the word support. I did not, now maybe I didn't read the whole thing or maybe there's some additions or changes made. I just thought it said the school district will support the foundation. Is it more specific than that? Just so you know, our attorneys did draft that MOU, and, and Mr. Kelly and I were both on the board when, when that happened. And so our approval of the MOU, so that decision's already been made. It can be revisited. Um, and then also, I just want to clarify that we absolutely approve the dollars that come to us. So that happens every year. And we, have, we've, we formally approve, I'm sorry. The grants? Yes. Accepting the grants. And, and when, when is that done? It's done just before the grants are given to teachers. Mr. Wilson came fairly recently to the board and presented the grant funds to the board and they accepted them for distribution to teachers. So it's simply January. not, it's not possible for those monies <laughs> to th flow through to the teachers without our, with this body's approval. That simply cannot happen. So I just want to be clear that we do <coughs> take action annually on the grants themselves, but also uh, every few years, uh, three, four years in this case, I think three years on the MOU. Um, so we'll it's, yeah, it's that. coming up in September. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, it's whenever we put it on the. So I think um, I, I would also like to hear um, what every everybody thinks about this, but I think it's important to understand that the issue at hand, I think, is that. I don't think it's, a, Dr. Heron and her team work for months to develop the, the budget that comes to us and, and through a retreat and through presentations throughout the year on certain topics, the budget is not a surprise to us. It, it's something that we understand the logic behind, the themes behind, where the investment is going to go and for what purpose. So I'm reticent to add things afterwards in general 
That said, we've been talking about the supplemental pay issue for four months because we've heard from our bus drivers in particular that it is uh, a burden on them. And so I support adding that position to get that done because it's something that we have talked about. Um, I also support su providing support for the education, uh, uh, education Foundation, to your point, Dr. Beers, absolutely to a, on a wait and see um, basis because it may or may not be a good long-term solution. But um, it's certainly in order to keep that organization going, it's something that um, we, I think we should try to see uh, how, how it works. But I think because, two things, because it's an independent, uh, independent 501c3 working under its own authority, I think we need to be clear that any support we provide is directed by Dr. Heron, not another agency. I think that's uh, really important to... But we don't approve or disapprove or disapprove, disapprove of actions that they may or may not take. We have no control over how they operate. But we would have control over our own Our, our money, yeah, sure. Our I, get, I understand that. So I, so I think that's important to clarify. But so, so I support the position, and if that's where Dr. Heron wants to provide support, that's great. She wants to provide it somewhere else from another part of the central office, that's great too. But um, So uh, I guess my understanding about foundations is without our support, that foundation is going to collapse. Is that, is that what you're saying? We need to support them? That's what This administrative part of it so that they can't give $100,000 away? I'm, I'm, explain that to me. The letter that we received from, from Clarence Wilson indicated that they needed this, that they have um, relied on the $20,000 Ferguson grant for the last two years, and that grant's going away. And so that is the person that did all of their database work, all of their um, maintained their the tax records, all of the kind of data entry related things, um, making sure that if people gave their donations that they got a tax receipt, you know, all of those kind of kind of a clerical administrative support, and that there's there's nobody right now to replace that individual, and it's not just a matter. From what I hear, it's not just a matter of the money. It's a matter of not having any kind of a um, constant um, person. That they can't find somebody. Even if they were to self-fund it through their um, the board's money, trying to find someone to work between 10 and 15 hours a week is with no benefits, and no, you know, it's just on a kind of, as you might get someone, and then as soon as that person finds something better, they're gonna leave, and then you're in the same position. Uh, it's, a, it's just an untenuous position. So I think- They could, if, if they used one of our employees, they could provide some of the financial support for that position. That's, well, Wouldn't what they? they're asking for mm -hmm. is, is for that administrative support to come from the school system as a, and, and the way Dr. Heron is, um, has positioned this, is it would actually be a, a, a viable position that someone would want to, to have because they could be serving two different purposes. I they understand. could They could help with uh, um, paying our, bus drivers and custodians and cafeteria workers twice a so month. So the two are really connected, aren't they? They are connected. Whether we have somebody who gets paid twice a month, we need to hire somebody to deal with that. That's correct. Sir. And the other half of that position is to provide support for the educational foundation. So they are actually, they are actually connected, aren't they? Well, it, it well, I'll let well, I think there's there's a definite need of, if the board really chooses and, and wants to reinstate the, the bi-monthly, the supplemental pay mid-month, there is a need for a position. Because that is on the table, 
I believe there's an opportunity to take a piece of that to support the foundation, not 50%, but less than that. Um, yes, the foundation could pay for a piece of a position, but I think for me that would blur the lines of authority over that position because they'd be serving two entities and I think that would be more difficult for us to, to manage in-house. Another thing I'd, oh, Mrs. Young, I'm sorry, you've got. Just, I was just saying, if I understand the idea of, uh, of having authority over that position, could that, I mean, we're coming up to a, a renegotiation of the MOU, could that be part of the MOU? I'm, to, to me, I, I would prefer that the, found, I, I do totally support the foundation, number one, uh, just seeing little bits tonight, I mean, and see how excited the kids are, that's, that's the work of the foundation right there. Um, but is there a way, when it comes time to renegotiate the MOU or to talk about it, that, uh, that, that the foundation would provide part of the support for that, for that job, but at the same time would grant uh, authority to you only or to the school division for the way that position is managed because I, it seems to me that could work because and I, I don't think a, one person can serve two masters I totally understand that concept but I would really like them to uh, become self-sufficient and uh, with our support I think if that could be worked out in the MOU I think that is a possibility but um, I, I agree with doc, Dr. Beers on uh, the idea that um, I, I have a, an issue with using taxpayer dollars for this foundation. So, I think you know. I think the the, the other thing is that um, um, by revisiting the MOU um, and have a, a much franker discussion with members of that board than I think we've had in the past. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly, uh, um, I'm going to support that, um, I, but I, um, I, I don't think um, that foundation uh, in perpetuity gets financial support from the very same organization that they are then going to turn around and give the money back. It's like, rather than give the money back, why don't you reduce the amount of money that you're going to give back? You follow me? We're giving them money. Say it's, I don't know what the position's going to cost. Maybe it's $30,000 or whatever. We give them $30,000 to pay for that position. And then they turn around and give us $30,000 back as part of the money to the, uh, you know, uh, the grants. I just, I don't know. It just, um, it just seems really bizarre. To me. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, to my thoughts on um, the position, the financial position, I am in support of that. I think it's important that we are able to pay our bus drivers and employees who um, are struggling with the one time a month payment. So, I'm in support of adding that position. And in, in my mind, um, what Dr. Heron decides to do with that position in addition to, to the supplemental pay is, is, is not my decision. So I support the finance position so that we can pay our employees um, twice a month. With regard to the foundation, I, th I think we've been lucky for operating under an existing MOU that if they had not had the grant, we probably would have already been providing some level of support. Um, but they had the grant, and so they didn't have a need to come to us when they began. Um, this is the first time that there was a need for them to come to us. There, there is a model out there where school divisions support the educational foundations. I think in a spirit of collaboration and partnership, it is appropriate to support the foundation. Again, what that support looks like is not, is not my decision. That I, I defer that back to Dr. Heron. So I, we are operating under an existing MOU which allows us to support the foundation and I, I am in support of that. We will revisit that in September um, and, and that might change, but, but in my mind, um, we're lucky that we 
are having this conversation now when we didn't have it three years ago. Um, and then I have a clarifying question <laughs> to Ms. Barnes. So when we switched to the new software um, that Ms. Berta brought to us, the financial software, and the decision was made to go to once a month um, payroll, um, but the idea of adding supplemental um, payroll again, we've had we had to go back and look and see was that possible with this new software, yes, and, and it is. I know, I, so I understand that it is. <clears throat> is. Will there be a cost to tweak that software? Actually, no, it will not. Okay. Um, to go to two complete payrolls a month, there would be. However, going to to taking care of the supplemental pays as we did before, they said no. We would have to set up um, new tables for the supplemental pay. And then, but because our, the other pays are based on hourly pays, we can actually tax them appropriate, appropriately. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I just uh, want to say I am in support of the of the bi-monthly um, for our employees. So I'm in support of that, uh, and along with uh, the rest of the majority of the board, it looks like I'm. I'm in support of doing whatever we need to do following the superintendent's recommendation for supporting the Education Foundation as well. Uh, and I do think we should look at this again when the MOU comes. I, I think it's, it's just have the discussion, uh, hash things out, uh, look at all sides and all possibilities. I did want to clarify that the board um, pays for about 15000 I understand, about $15,000 worth of printing costs, um, the, doing the annual report, the mailings, all of those kind of things come out of the uh, boards, the WJCC executive board and the board members' contributions to the foundation, so that um, so that's on that's on top of this administrative twenty thousand uh, dollar grant that Ferguson gave us. So I I didn't want people to think that the only administrative expenses that the board has been uh, dealing with has just been that part time employee. They. The board has also been paying for at least fifteen thousand dollars a year for the mailings and all that, and they and the foundation board, and they are uh, anticipating that that will continue. They're not um, asking for that expense to be handled by the school. So I just wanted to clarify that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm confused. They don't want it to be considered. It's, they haven't been that that. Expense is absorbed by the <coughs> board members themselves. So every they're, you mean their board members? Yes. Okay. I, Sorry. I, I, I just wanted the to foundation know. board members. So I just wanted to make that clear that there it, it isn't this this big pass through to from the foundation to the um, the WJCC school system. There's there's there is money that the school foundation board itself raises to support the operating expenses. I just wanted to clarify. The only other thing I, uh, in response to uh, Ms. Ombi is uh, comments is I really believe that this foundation uh, should report to our school board, not to the superintendent. Because the, the, the school board is the one that um, um, has that fiscal responsibility. And, you know, I appreciate the um, collaboration between the superintendent and the foundation. <coughs> um, I just think that um, it's one of those, and it's a gray area, but I just think that the foundation um, needs to acknowledge uh, the school board that that it's um, uh, it's that in some way it is responsible to the school board. You can't take money from the school board, not have some responsibility back to the school board. 
the superintendent is not paying the foundation. The money's coming from a budget that the school board approves. So um, with that, uh, I'm not going to oppose it. I may not vote at all, but I do think that um, the way I'm going to look at it is, okay, well, I'm, I don't agree with it, but we'll do it for the next six months or whenever it starts. When are you planning? When were you planning to start um, with that position and paying for their stuff? I presume we would start at the beginning of the next fiscal year uh, when we would make the changeover back to the supplemental pay. We'd have that position on just before that timeline. So they're not expecting any additional funds? Does their grant run out at the end of the fiscal year? I don't know Does anybody the, know that? Or is it already run out? I think it's, it's already run out. I think it's before the end of the fiscal year, but I don't know the exact Okay, date. okay. Okay, so it could be, um, it could be only a couple of months then. If we change, if we make it, if we decide when, when we look at that uh, MOU again in September, that we change our minds. So I'm just, uh, so they've been without that grant since July 1 last year. Somebody Let, should know that. Does yeah. anybody know that? But, but you know, the uh, item on the, let's not talk about the foundation because that's not on the agenda tonight. And It's not on the agenda. It's part of the budget. Actually, it's not. This is about a finance position. So I think that's really appropriate to talk about what their internal operations are. We're talking about an independent. And we're going to use half of that position. No, that's incorrect. To support it. We're not going to use half of that position Cor to support it. No, them. not half. No. Okay, well, I'm, I guess I'm hearing two different uh, two different things. I kind of get a poll on where everybody is on this finance position and Dr. Heron's proposal on how to employ that person's time. Is everybody interested in putting that in the budget or not? So the direction from the board at this point is to put that in the budget. So then we'll talk about security and then we'll talk about whether we take away anything because we've added something if that's okay so we have provided to us by dr heron uh, and ms barnes some information on security guards um, i entertain discussion on that topic I'll share my two thoughts, two cents. Um, I think security is is um, something that's very important. Um, for for me, I think we need to look at the bigger picture. Um, I'm not. I, I don't know if this is the best approach. I'm not sure what the best approach is. And so I, I guess for me, I would want um, actually to step back and look at security overall. Um, and and, um, and, and what is best practice kind of nationally and, and where, do we, where do we fit in in terms of um, the security that we're providing now? Um, as the chair mentioned earlier, um, the superintendent and, and staff have developed this budget over a period of time and we are adding to it. Um, and so my, my struggle is I don't, I don't know if, if adding those security personnel right now for the next fiscal year is, is the best approach. Maybe we need to add m more security personnel than what we're putting into the budget, or maybe it's something different. I, I don't know. I would, I would rather direct staff to, um, to study that and give me more information so that I, I would know long-term rather than um, create a position that's going to have an ongoing cost, and I don't know if that's the best use of our monies. Yeah, yeah I, I do not want to wait. Um, first of all, the gentleman that spoke tonight, um, uh, he's, he's hit the nail on the head. And, and this is an ongoing discussion we have had for 28 years. 28 years. You would think after 28 years we would have had made some decisions about school security. 
Um, this, this school division has gone, I think, beyond probably what many school divisions have done. And, and looking at the information that was given to us, thank you, Ms. For, Mrs. Cook, for asking for it. Uh, it says that each high school has a full-time SRO assigned. If we just listen to what happened in Maryland, uh, it was the SRO who saved lives. Um, and we're fortunate to have one in each of our high schools. Hornsby Middle and Toyota Middle School each have a full-time SRO assigned. Berkeley Middle School has a part-time SRO assigned, and it looks like uh, Berkeley Middle School, the middle, Berkeley and Middle School, Berkeley and Blair Middle Schools will be sharing one. Mm -hmm. Um, and I see what Police uh, Chief uh, Sean Dunn has put in here. Um, I, um, I personally would like more security at the schools. And I, when I brought this up at the last um, meeting, I believe that it, we need to start incrementally. And I understand that we don't know what is best practice at this point. But I'm not sure that that answer is out there. Um, Right now, as he pointed, the gentleman pointed out, there's 16 states that already allow um, security in our schools, in their schools, to carry um, to carry guns. And I know that there is a lot of discussion nationally about gun control. I'm not interested in that discussion. Period. I'm interested in keeping our schools secure. Uh, I never want to sit here in this board, ever. Uh, and have to face parents who have lost children. So my response to that is I would like to do more rather than less. Uh, I'd, I'm happy to do, deal with whatever our school superintendent uh, recommends, but uh, we did talk about getting three additional security guards to be in the middle schools. I would, I would think that, or four, because we're gonna have four middle schools. I think that's a good place to begin. And then perhaps to approach um, Williamsburg City and providing full-time um, SROs at Berkeley and Blair Middle because I want students protected. Um, we protect money. <laughs> you go to a bank, we protect celebrities. We protect a lot of people. But the, most, the only people I care about are the students in our, in our school district. I care about them. I want them safe. And so um, I'll defer to our superintendent, but that's, that's where I stand at this moment. Thank you, Mrs. Pierce. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, um, even though I know we have a tight budget, um, there needs to be a security officer uh, at who is specifically very much trained. Uh, one of the, I, I would even go a step further and say there ought to be one in ele every elementary school as well. Sandy Hook was an elementary school. So I, and, and, and if we can't afford to take, pay for the administrative costs of the foundation because we need, need that money to pay for uh, security officers, then so be it. Because I'm, I'm the same way. I don't ever want to be in a situation where I have to say, well, I'm sorry, that security officer was half time here and half time there, and he just happened to be over at that school, so there was nobody here um, at that time. So I, it's the same thing I say about the cameras. I don't, I don't, it's not that I don't care if we can go back and see how somebody got into the building and what halls they ran down because we have really great cameras. I want those used in a way so we can see people coming into the building, across the campus, whatever it might be. And I know it's not perfect, but the notion that somebody is watching might defer somebody. That's all, that's all I wanna say about that. Kelly? So the, um, the SROs, are the SROs in our budget? They're, they're not. They're not paid by WJCC. They're paid by the Jane City County or or the City of Williamsburg. So the uh, security guards that we're we're talking about here, Mrs. Cook's question for forty thousand four hundred thirty-one dollars are um, is the proposal that they're they're trained and armed. None of our security officers in our schools are armed, sir. Right, so the only people that are armed are, are our SROs. SROs, and they're employed by the county and city. They're trained 
police officers. So, 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 so if if we're looking at having more SROs, the conversation needs to go to the city and the county, and not not to the school board because we don't we don't pay them because because they are police officers and they have certain duties that we can't. They if we pay them, they report to us versus to the chief of police of the county or the city. So, um, and you know, and and I and as I appreciate the comments of uh, Mrs. Owenby about about um, you know the, uh, having having a study of what what is the best method for and best practice for school security. Uh, you know, I, I work at a place that's fairly secure, and there's not somebody watching every camera every day um, and every minute of every day. So so I don't know if that's if that's necessarily a best practice to have to have that happen. Um, so I, I, I think we need I think we need to make sure that we're that we're uh, doing due diligence. We have done a lot of work um, in security in, in our schools over the past few years, um, and continue to do that uh, with with our vestibule fuel improvements and with our cameras and and that kind of thing. And so the cameras are there. Um, there's not somebody assigned to watch them necessarily, but that doesn't mean they're not being watched. So that's so there is there is that deterrent there. So. Um, I'm not sure if I'm if I'm necessarily in favor of of uh, putting security guards that are not um, not armed into the schools because I'm not sure that well, how effective that would be. Um, I think the best um, best opportunity acting our be with making sure that we have an SRO in all in all of our schools, ideally, especially the middle schools, um, and not sharing an SRO between middle schools. And since that is not our budget, um, I think I would <laughs> I would like our citizens to ask our, our to provide the SROs to to think about providing the SROs to our schools our children safe um, I, I think that's something that mr. Kelly and I can bring up at liaison committee um, because it is a locality funded thing I just want to talk maybe a little bit about clarity about what positions that do what so SROs are, as we said, funded by the localities. They are police officers that report to the police departments of each locality, but their primary purpose is not security. Their primary purpose is community policing. So they're there to get to know kids, to have lunch with kids, to be mentors to kids, um, to learn about what's going on in the community from kids. Uh, to, so it's heavily um, focused on prevention and community policing uh, as opposed to um, the physical safety of the students or the um, or the building. Um, security guards, on the other hand, who are not armed, are there to keep order, right? I mean, so they're there at athletic events, they're there after school to keep an eye on things and make sure that, that everyone's behaving. Is that a fair? So I just don't want to conflate the two roles. I think you've captured the roles reasonably well. Um, so, and I, I, I think that, um, again, I like the idea of having security guards, particularly at the middle school. Uh, has I'd like to ask Dr. Heron, have the principals asked for that, and it just didn't make it up to us, or it actually was a, uh, a hot item in the budget last year, but we didn't discuss it this year. But it was something that the middle school principals did bring up, and it was something they really wanted last year. And why did they want it? Uh, simply for coverage of of games and after school activities, and to have an extra. Uh, adult in the building, you know, with the number of students was very significant at middle school to have only one assistant principal, and this would have been another level of um, another adult in the building to help with to keep the, the students safe and secure. But it, for us, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable adding them into the budget right now at, at this kind of late hour because it feels unilateral to me, and I do think that there is a conversation to be had with public safety. Go ahead. 
Well, so, so um, is one of the reasons why it, it didn't make it to the middle schools this year is because next year they'll be at a lower capacity percentage. And so they'll, you'll have more, quote unquote, adults per student in there anyway. Honestly, it's a conversation we just didn't have this year. Okay. Doesn't mean the need's not there, but it's just not a conversation that didn't rise to the surface this year. Right, so when all the, when all the middle schools are at 100% um, capacity, and you have you have an AP and a principal, and so now that now that we open up another school, we're reducing capacities somewhat. I, don't, I just don't know if that was part of the thinking or not. Sorry. But security isn't just SROs, and it isn't just security guards. It's making sure that we're using the security infrastructure that we have appropriately, making sure we're not propping doors open, making sure that we're, you know, using entrances and exits appropriately. Um, so to me, it seems like a, a very high priority, but one that requires more research and, qu and, and questions to be answered. So that's why I'm not comfortable putting it in this, this budget, but um, I think, you know, Ms. Taylor, what do you? I agree, at this point, the cost would be too significant and not having the information that we need and working with the localities and knowing these things I don't think we could justify putting it in at this late hour. I'd like to put it in. I absolutely want it put in. And um, I, I sent out a message to the school board about public law that was passed by the, uh, it was House Bill 1392, I believe, that said that you could hire um, retired police who are trained and they then they could uh, work with an S with the SRO office to, uh, to help them learn more about kids, and hopefully they would like kids. But they, they can be armed in our schools, and um, as uncomfortable as that may make people feel, a um, person who solved the problem in Maryland had a gun. So I would like the security in the budget this year. Dr. Beers? I want it in the budget. I think that's the direction of the board is to, um, Mr. Kelly and I will bring it up at li liaison committee. Um, and then um, if staff could work to help us better understand um, what we need to do, we'll talk to local law enforcement and look at what we're already doing and so with that we've added one position in finance to tune of it's 46 that, yeah um, what is the board's um, feeling on taking something out or just adding? Oh. So along those lines, I, I wanted to have um, clarification about our buses and our, the bus replacement schedule and where exactly we're at. Are we ahead? Are we where we need to be? That's kind of a mixed question or kind of a mixed answer. Um, we we had that we would replace 12 buses next year and that we weren't replacing any this year. So, but we've replaced, I think, four and we're hoping to replace two more at the end of this year. Um, actually, we, we, we used the end of year funds with an end of year spending plan and <coughs> thought we're able to purchase four to get us ahead in next year's larger number that were on the overtime replacement cycle. So I think when I did the, the last replacement schedule, we were actually at eight. So having two more next year, of course, helps keep us up to date. And then the additional two, possibly in a year-end spending plan next year. Any monies at the end of this year, then we would automatically, with the board's approval, consider those uh, the purchase. If, if we were to add 50, before I actually pull everyone on the adding 
taking, if we were to add roughly $50,000 to this budget, what does staff propose would come out to balance that if we decided not to add to the amount? Buses? Buses? Piece of a bus? A tire? Half a bus? <laughs> wheels, a spare tire. Of, wheels of the bus? Um, I, I think it's the one thing that's a one time expense that we can hope to do some of if there's any money left at the end of the year. Everything else, it's really difficult to even see where we would look because we've trimmed and we've been very budgeting. On a, on a budget of $137,808,944 and we're adding $48,000, $50,000 to it, um, I'm going to hope that the state gives us 50 grand more and we'll be fine. So I would just I would just add it to the to the budget number that we have now, and uh, send that to the supervisors. And if it comes back that they don't fund our forty eight thousand dollar five hundred and twenty two dollar position, whatever it is, um, then we find somewhere to fit that into our hundred and thirty seven million eight hundred and eight thousand dollar budget. Well, you're nodding. How about you, Mrs. Young? I think we sh it should be added. Dr. Veers, what do you think? I'm ready to approve the budget as presented. I'm all in favor. Great. Okay, we'll just add it. But for the record, I think we're opening a new school this year, and so I just. But okay, we'll add it. The state's going to give us 50 grand. We're fine. Right. We're good. Well, you segue nicely into a question I wanted to ask because the General Assembly did leave uh, end session without a budget, which essentially means they start over. Uh -huh. I mean, the, govern the governor could introduce an entirely new budget. The House could do the same, and so could the Senate. So what we think we know, we may indeed not know at all. I would be correct. So <laughs> we are in the enviable position of having to adopt a budget request um, without having any idea what the state might do. Is that? That would be accurate. Great. <laughs> I can add, though, that the, even though they haven't determined how they want to spend it, the pot of money that they have to spend is the same. So when you look at the, the three versions, there's very little difference. So I'm, I'm feeling like we're going to get very close to what we have projected. Hopefully it will be the additional 46,695. Um, the Senate version was slightly less. The House version was, was more. So, and the governor's budget, I can't say it was in the middle, but. $50,000 more. <laughs> no, it was good. more than the Senate. <laughs> yes. It's only 40, it only needs to be 46, so we're, you know, we're in good shape. Okay. Does anyone have any other questions or comments? Are we? The only comment is that we are often in this position in March where we don't know um, to, with the General Assembly. Um, you know, they had they had one job in January and February and failed to do it. <laughs> they did a lot of other stuff, but they didn't they didn't do that. So they they go back in, they go back in April. The 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 more interesting part is that th we ha this has to be we have to it goes to the supervisors it comes back and we have to approve by the first of May. And there's no guarantee that that uh, the folks in Richmond will have done their job by the 1st of May. Right. Actually, uh, I think we can come back and, and look at this on the 15th. Uh, I believe that's actually what we have in our um, our uh, budget calendar because, of course, by that time we'll know what the city and county are, are going to do. And uh, looking at previous years, when we've had to make a change, we've come back to you at that time. So we should know more. Hopefully, we'll know more what the General Assembly is, is going to do. So oftentimes, we know that we don't know what we know. It's just more dramatic this time. $400 million. All right, anything else? Is, is everybody ready to take action tonight? Oh, I'm sorry. Ms. Barnes, I just wanted to thank you for answering all my questions. Oh, Very welcome. It's my pleasure. Thank you for helping me understand the budget. Oh, that's, I love doing it, so it's my pleasure. Okay. Is everybody ready to move on to the next item? And put, okay. So the m motion then, will you help, because we have to do it by 
by fund category? Right, by category. Um, our policy actually says that you approve the total budget. However, the state code, of course, dictates that it's, that it's set up by classification. So I actually do have the amounts. Um, you want to hand them to someone up here? So that sure. Are board docs. Let me see. Are in board docs? The, the amended? No. Well, not the amended. You just have to add 46,690. 46, okay, you can do that, Mr. Kelly. Would you like to? Oh, yeah. So we're going to move on to action. Okay, so I have to see so you. I read by category. Is the right number for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm positive. positive. I have all the faith in the world. In I looked at my crystal ball the other day. <laughs> as far as so I, I do this and that? Yes, sir. So, yeah, now that, boys. can I have a motion to approve the fiscal year 2019 operating, 2019 operating budget, please? Madam Chair, I move that we approve the budget with um, category instruction one hundred million two hundred thirty one thousand six hundred ninety one dollars administration three million four hundred seventy two thousand six hundred and fifteen dollars attendance and health four million six hundred thirteen thousand one hundred eighty four dollars transportation eight million nine hundred thirty seven thousand six hundred fifty one dollars operations and maintenance twelve million six hundred three thousand six hundred twenty five dollars technology seven million nine hundred ninety six thousand $873, which is obviously a total operating fund of $137,855,639 from, from the operating fund, I guess this is our revenue, right? Operating fund, operating revenue of $137,855,639, grants of $5,772,610,000, state operated money $1,129,000, and $59 and child nutrition $4,710,910 for obviously the grand total of $149,468,218 for all funds. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Can I have a second, please? <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? I would like to thank um, Ms. Barnes and the administration for all the work that it was put in to develop this budget and to answer our incessant questions, um, particularly from a couple of folks sitting to the left of me. And um, um, I, I appreciate all that, all the good work and, and uh, um, you know, it's a very detailed budget and very, very transparent and um, very obvious where the dollars are coming from. So I, I appreciate um, you and Dr. Heron and your staffs for all their uh, all their great work in uh, in support of developing the budget, and we'll be back here again in a month. I'd like to echo what he said. Yeah. Anyway, it's been moved and seconded. Ms. Sersa, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Young, no. Mrs. Taylor, aye. Ms. Ownby, aye. Mr. Kelly, aye. Ms. Hummel, aye. Dr. Beers? Aye. Ms. Cook? Aye. So our operating budget request has, um, has passed, and we will now send it to the localities. Um, just a reminder, as I say every year, this is our budget now, so um, this is our request, so it's our job now to, per our SOP, advocate for it and to work collaboratively to um, make sure that our funders understand what our needs are and um, advocate for their support of it. So anyway, with that, we move on to 9.02, award a contract for invitation for bid number 18-12117, construction services for the Laurel Lane Elementary School HVAC replacement. May I have a motion, please? Madam, go ahead. Oh, Madam Chair, I move that we award a contract for invitation for bid 18-12117, construction services for the Laurel Lane Elementary School HVAC replacement to Comfort Systems in the amount of $2,480,400. a second, please. Second. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Any, question, any questions, comments? Dr. Heron, do you have anything to add? 
I would just like to take the quick opportunity to introduce Mr. Jim Fozell, manager of facilities, who's here tonight. <laughs> as Mr. Snipes is not available, uh, just to just to let you know he's here tonight, and, and I don't think you've had an opportunity to meet him yet. Welcome. Hi, how are you? Yay, welcome. Yay. Excellent. Excellent. Well, good evening, Madam Chair and the members of the board, and certainly to you, Dr. Heron. Thank you for the introduction. So um, I'm Jim Falzone, and I am new with uh, the facilities department, the facilities, uh, the su uh, supervisor of facilities and capital projects. So uh, if you do have any questions about this project, I'm prepared to answer the best I can. I've been here two weeks. Oh, good. So for your first board question. <laughs> yeah, seriously, here it goes. So I understand <laughs> I, it, it appears the budget for this was 4214852 and uh, we've come in substantially under budget on this? It is correct. Yes, um, it was originally, uh, the budget was estimated uh, nearly 18 months ago um, for the purposes of our CIP and you know, just the planning. Um, about the best explanation I can have is that now that we've actually drawn up the, the plans and put this project out for bid, um, contractors seem like they're hungry right now. It's maybe a different climate than it was about 18 months, months ago. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? And moved and seconded. Sir, so, we call the roll, please? Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Passes. That brings us to 9.03, uh, award a contract for request for proposal. Uh, Mr. Felzone, you may want to stick around. Yes. <laughs> I, th I think Ms. Barnes is taking this one on oh, furniture. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Th thank you, Mr. Fulton. I apologize. Um, award a contract for, for, for request thank for proposal number 18-12058, furnishings for James Blair Middle School. Can I have a motion, please? Madam Chair, I move award a contract for request for proposal 18-12058, furnishings for James Blair Middle School to image business interiors in the amount of 472000 Seven hundred and sixty-eight and Delta Graphic in the amount of three hundred two thousand one hundred and twenty-two dollars. I have a second. Second. Moved and seconded. Any questions? Discussion? Not for Mr. Felzone, but for Ms. Barnes. So I guess. I guess. Who who picked the furniture? Okay. Taste. He have good taste. <laughs> it was a committee of seven, and and that reviewed the uh, the proposals, and it was really actually you know being female, it was really interesting because you get to look at the catalogs, and but but Mr. Harris had a specific um, vision for the new school, and um, and he won us over, but we we did look for the quality, uh, for the style, for the price, uh, warranties, references, everything, and and came up with the two best candidates. Is there a color scheme? I'm sorry? A color scheme? I'm not sure if he has finished with that. Of course, we were looking at um, uh, just the colors within the catalogs. Um, and I know he was trying to keep costs down as well. So there'll be continuity, but he's not going for the, you know, the, the high-priced fancy colors, how to speak. Are we not, is Blair not going to be black -white? I'm not sure if yeah, all the colors was, are matching, right? but we can with certainly. The, with the mean Yes, spider. everything will match. <laughs> it's just. Spider. No, I just was wondering if whether it's whether we're keeping the same color. Uh, I, but I think in, in one presentation from Mr. Harris, there's, he gave us the colors, and there's a slight ch there's a slight change. Yeah. I think okay. it used to be gold, but now it's silver. So I'm, it's very I'm sure we, we can get the board the, the colors for the Thank school you. again. Yes. Yeah. The spirit wear. Yeah. And I'm particularly interested in, in the paint colors because it was as though we purple was on sale when we opened up um, Hornsby and JBB because they're all purple. All the walls are purple. So I just wonder if they're going to be purple again. I think everything's going to match. <laughs> so they could all be purple. Okay. Anything else of substance? Okay. Thanks. It's been <laughs> it's um, been moved and seconded. Ms. Serza, will you call the roll, please? Mrs. Taylor. Aye. Mrs. Young. Aye. Dr. Beers. Aye. Ms. Hummel. Aye. Mr. Kelly. Aye. Ms. Ownby. Aye. Ms. Cook. Aye. Excellent. James Blair will now have furnishings. 
That brings us to um, board member comments and requests. Ms. Taylor, do you have anything to share? Just stay safe in the snow tomorrow. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Young. Yes, uh, I had the opportunity to visit uh, Lafayette High School on two occasions during the past couple of weeks. <clears throat> And I want to thank uh, Dr. Holloman for the amazing visit that we had there. Um, it was informative. Um, I didn't get to wear my hard hat, but I'm looking forward to it at some future point. And I want to thank uh, Ms. DiPaolo for uh, the amazing visit uh, that she arranged for us uh, to visit the, EA, the Newcomers Academy at Lafayette High School. That was probably one of the um, funnest experiences I've had in a long time, I wanted to be I wanted to be a Spanish speaker in, learn, in her class because uh, the the teacher was outstanding. I, I don't know, can I mention her name, uh, Miss uh, Guzman? She was amazing, and when we left, her her class thought so too. I think they were glad we just left, but they cheered for her, which tells tells me how much they appreciated her. Um, but it it was an amazing visit, and I'm eternally. Um, impressed with the quality of our teachers. Uh, I also want to thank Dr. Hudson for the visit to Warhill High School um, and that um, with uh, Ms. Ownby. Uh, that is a big school and they need a renovation there. I think they need to get rid of all of those lockers and they could make more space because those lockers are underutilized. And um, But I was an amazing visit and I do appreciate uh, the time spent with us from with a, uh, from administration because I know that takes away the time. The only thing I regret is I didn't get to do the wobble at at uh, Lafayette High School during lunch. So. Thank you, Mrs. Young. Dr. Beers, do you have anything? Yes, um, I also enjoyed that um, Lafayette tour that uh, Mrs. DiPaolo set up for us, and I have to admit the virtual learning. Um, in the library. Um, that's the first time I've had experienced anything like that. And to actually reach up and touch a giant jellyfish and watch it move away was just, uh, that was so over the top. And I almost wish I was back at school now because that, that, was, that was really incredible. The other thing that, um, that we saw that I've just, I, 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 we had asked to go out and see that. Um, a, a while ago, and our schedules are, you know, just couldn't be able to do it. But, but to watch Julie Guzman um, work with her um, or students in the Newcomers Academy uh, was phenomenal. Um, they were not self-conscious. They went back and forth from English to Spanish, and um, they were um, they were they were focused on irony, um, which was. Um, uh, a really interesting topic for them, and they had really good ideas about what was ironic and, and what was n not. But I was just, um, um, it was a really good example of a community of learners that had come from other parts of the world that were, that, that obviously felt uh, really secure and confident in, in what they were uh, trying to do, and that was trying to uh, navigate through English in the curriculum, and um, uh, it was phenomenal. Um, and then um, uh, today, um, uh, I'm sorry uh, uh, that, um, Carrie, you were not able to go to that, but John McLennan, my um, county supervisor, and I um, got a tour from Dr. Worley out of Jamestown High School, and we were pretty specific about, we really wanted to see some project learning um, and what it actually looked like. And, um, and we got right into some classrooms. Um, uh, and it was clear that groups of kids were highly engaged, um, couldn't wait to tell us, to talk to us about um, the project that they were working on. And one young man even came out into the hall to point out his, uh, his whole thing on iodine, it was on the wall, um, which I thought was um, really something. But the other, and, but it, it really ended um, in all places uh, in an art room with Mrs. Fur, who um, had a, a marvelous way of combining um, genetics and art 
um, and they had studied genetics, and now they were in the process of creating their own self-portrait. Um, and I, I, I just thought um, uh, that that was a, a wonderful example of integrating the curriculum in a way that the students really, uh, they really got into it. They really enjoyed it. Um, and uh, she promised that I would be allowed to come into the classroom when the kids were uh, working on their self-portraits just so I can uh, see the other part of it. But I, uh, um, it, was, it was really um, time well spent. And I commend um, all the folks that we looked at and, and talked to uh, and what they're doing out there. Dr. Beers, Mr. Kelly? I, I just wanted to say that I really thought, I really enjoyed the academics and the board recognitions tonight. Um, um, you know, beyond that, the, the students from Bladen using their foundation grants and the, their engagement and, and doing that and that coding, I think that was uh, great to see. Uh, seeing the Teacher of the Years um, tonight and uh, looking forward to their banquet tonight in April. Oh, gosh, I thought you would know that. But so in about a month of the Teacher of the Year ceremony with the, uh, uh, where we recognize the, 25th. April 25th, the little birdie tells me. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that and seeing, and seeing them, uh, seeing them getting the recognition they certainly deserve. And um, the Scholastic Bowl team, the state championship Scholastic Bowl team tonight, uh, I went to their, to their state championship um, match and uh, was completely stunned. Um, by, by actually both teams that were that were there, um, and James and Jamestown's team won by 10, 10 points, I think, or fifteen points, and they had been undefeated all year. They had never been that close. And and uh, t talking to Mr. Ames, he's like, "I'm glad they don't. I couldn't I couldn't handle the stress." But uh, the uh, watching those kids, um, those students answer those questions was just amazing to me. Um, the the breadth of the knowledge, the depth of the knowledge. Uh, was just incredible. So I, I, I really enjoyed tonight's board recognitions with, with uh, the, the emphasis on the academics. So thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Ms. Hummel? Um, well, I just wanted to say that spring is here. It is the first day of spring, which to me as a mother always represented um, high school musicals. So I just wanted to say it is high school musical season coming up. And um, I just love to go to all, so I want to in, in, invite myself with all the school board members, whoever wants to come with me, to try to go see all of them. Um, I think that our spring musicals show project-based learning, show teamwork, uh, and, and great entertainment for $10 a ticket, um, but mainly just seeing where these kids start and where they end up is just amazing. And it's a, a fun thing for me. So that's what spring means to me at WJCC is spring musicals. And, and no snow. And no snow. No snow. No more snow days. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Berkeley Middle School and the play last week, um, Little Mermaid Junior. It was phenomenal. Um, and I enjoyed it because it was so inclusive. So many students um, were in the ensemble and got to participate, and they always do a bang-up job. So shout out to their theater department. And want to um, congratulate again our teachers of the year and our student athletes. Um, we do have a phenomenal division. Um, and, and, and we can and see that um, with the teachers that we have and the students that we have. And wanted to wish our band students good luck this week. Um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, our middle school and high school band students will be participating in their statewide band assessments at Jamestown High School pretty much all day long um, those days. And then wanted to um, give a shout out to our guidance, all of our guidance staff who are working with our students now at the middle school and high school level selecting courses. Um, we have some exciting new options because of the um, program of studies. I know that my own children, my sixth grader and my um, rising seventh grader and rising ninth grader and my rising senior are very excited um, about the options that we have. So. We need to shift from premier to phenomenal. That's what I'm, that's what I'm hearing tonight. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to add um, comments about the um, board recognitions tonight, particular teacher of the year. I wanted to thank them and congratulate them, but also the principals that support them, that allow them to be 
to do their best work, and then the people who nominated them too. I mean, it's a real community, and uh, I, I was very pleased to see such excellence in, in one room. And then uh, I, I don't want to repeat everything everyone else has already said, but I will say that um, I thought the joint meeting that we had last week was a success. I think having that speaker um, was a good uh, good thing. Mis uh, Mr. Regenball came in and I think shared some eye-opening information, depressing, but eye-opening um, about kind of why we're in the situation we're in. And so I appreciated his coming down and um, sharing with us his his thoughts. So with that, any other comments? All right. At uh, upcoming meetings, uh, the policy committee meeting. The policy committee is meeting. At, at, on, on the 21st of March at 8.15 in the room 309 of the annex at the school board central office. 21st Century and Career Ready Advisory Committee, Mrs. Young and her crew are meeting on March 28th at 3.30 p.m. in room 309 in the annex at the school board and central office. The Student Advisory Committee is also meeting on March 28th at 3 p.m. at Lafayette High School. Um, the School Liaison Committee is meeting on the 29th of March at 7.30 a.m. in room 300 in, in, in the Annex and School Board Central Office. And then the NSB Annual Conference is uh, April 7th through 9th in San Antonio, Texas. And that brings us to upcoming meetings. Our next meeting is a uh, closed session on the 10th of April at 5 p.m., earlier start time. 5 p.m. in room 309 at the Annex at School Board in, uh, Central Office at James Blair, followed by a work session and action items at 6.30, also in the Annex. And then closed session on the 17th of April at 6 p.m. here in Building F, followed by a regular meeting at 6.30, also in Building F. So if there's nothing else, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>